I'm Colin. And I'm Megan. And this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional, Confessional, an open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet. The road to recovery after COVID is going to look very different for each and every single one of our businesses. But what are some things that we can all be doing or should be looking to do to make that road as smooth as possible? Today, fellow podcaster, pet business owner, and coach Dominic Hodson joins the show to talk about digging out from COVID. Let's get started. Yeah, uh, my name is Dom Hodgson. I am known as the Pet Biz Wiz, and I am uh, been running pet businesses since 2011. Ran four different pet businesses. Three of them been really successful. One has been a complete disaster. Maybe we'll talk about that later on too. <laughs> um, but one of my um, my main uh, part of my business now is I am a pet business marketing um, consultant and coach. So I consult with um, pet businesses all over the world, help them with their marketing strategies, putting together campaigns, um, help them to grow their businesses really. And also I run the Pet Business in a Circle, uh, which is a place where pet business owners can come and learn how to do all of the stuff that's, um, that I've plugged into my own business really to, that's helped me to be um, uh, relatively successful with that. <laughs> yeah, you're a really busy guy. And so I really appreciate you taking the time out to come and talk to us today. And, and I think the, the impetus for today was really about like, about business minded, especially in a time of COVID. And, and so when you are talking with your, your coaching clients and other business owners in your area, what are you hearing from them about how they've been impacted? The initial impact was really quite severe. I think for almost everybody who has been affected by it, and I don't really know anybody who hasn't been affected by it, um, the initial shock and the initial uh, hit to almost everyone's income um, was quite dramatic and quite scary. And um, yeah, and, and it, you know, I mean, even just in general, putting business to one side, even, you know, I think everyone went through, even if you sailed through COVID, you, you must have at least went through a, a couple of weeks where you, you know, you didn't sleep very well, you were worried about your family or, or whatever. And, yeah, you know, every, pet business owners are no different. Um, but I think it very much depends upon what kind of pet business you had as to the extent at which you've been affected, you know. So um, from my own point of view, uh, we have a uh, dog adventure and a luxury home boarding business side of the business, which my son runs now. And that completely shut down, you know, so that was eight, nine weeks um, without any income at all for that. And the knock on effects of that have been uh, that most of the boarding that we had booked in for the rest of the year has gone to one side as well. So there's a fire engine going past. I'm not sure if you can hear it. <laughs> it's not an ice cream lorry or an ice cream van. I don't know what they call them over there. That was exciting. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, and then uh, similar with groomers, you know, groomers had a similar situation. They were completely shut down. Daycare, I, I found, was very similar as well. Uh, whereas dog trainers, obviously they've... Um, The ones who have been quite nimble, quite agile, they've been able to switch online and certainly, if not growing, keep going with their business as well. But tough, tough time for, you know, your primary audience, which is obviously pet sitters and and walkers and stuff. Yeah, it really has been. And you mentioned the dog trainers. Uh, The nimble ones were able to switch to an online format, provide videos on YouTube or, you know, or private coaching. You can't you can't really dog sit online. They haven't invented that yet, unfortunately. Unfortunately, well, you can't. But I'll I'll tell you a little, just a little insight. So I had um, I immediately as, as soon as lockdown hit, I immediately leapt into action. I created a a product primarily for my pet business in a circle members, which was you know how to take your dog training online, and it was based around the fact that. At that time, everyone was gravitating towards social media, really, you know, website views were down, Google searches were down, podcast listens were down, really, temporarily, and everyone was moving towards social media, you know, to connect, for that need to connect with anybody that would help them to, you know, feel normal, feel like a human being. So I kind of recognized that was going to be a tremendous opportunity for the whole of my client base, really. So as well as the dog trainers who moved online, we got them setting up local groups where they could position themselves as an expert, offer advice and help and tips and stuff. And then, you know, to keep themselves top of mind, to help them to build an audience to, so they were in a good position to 
mop up the pent up demand once we came out of COVID. Well, we actually managed to do that with some walkers and with some groomers as well. So they, they set up their own communities. And, you know, these are more kind of the walkers who were a bit more into training, you know, so maybe they had some basic dog training knowledge and, but also the groomers, you know, how to home groom your dog, all this kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was uh, sort of the most, I guess the lesson is the more skills you have, the more you're able to um, to adapt. Um, but yeah, there was, um, it was certainly an opportunity for everyone to experiment with that. Yeah, you mentioned there, keeping yourself top of mind, right? Like really taking that opportunity to go, how do I make sure people remember me and think of me first? whenever things start to open back up. So maybe, you know, maybe I'm not positioning myself being the busiest person right now, but I can keep myself positionally in the market at the top. One of the kind of tricks that I I teach my guys is you almost have to, you almost have to position yourself as being very busy before you are very busy (laughs) because it, uh, it, it really, you know, people want what they can't have. And if, you know, so this is exactly what I did when I first started back in 2011, you know, I was, uh, I was busy. I was driving my van all around town. I was making a tremendous fuss of the one or two dogs that I was walking at the time, you know, as well as making s- social media stars of my own dogs. Because <laughs> when you don't have any dogs to walk, you have to make you have to make do with your own dogs or your your mom's dog or your auntie's dog. Yeah. Um, but you know, this idea of just making yourself look busy um, is, is a big part of it, but yeah, you're right. What you say, keep in top of mind, you know, um, huge part of what I teach is about, you know, constantly communicating, um, and putting a message out there about your service, how it can help people, you know, why it's relevant for your existing clients. And that way with the, we've have constant communication, you, you kind of, you're always priming the pump, you know, so you're always generating interest. You're always bringing new people on board, obviously through, doing referral schemes and stuff like that, you can make that more of a predictable um, routine. Um, yeah, but keeping yourself top of mind, that's, that's the name of the game. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the, the communication there is so key of, of communicating not just your services, but that you're still there, right? You're still, you're still available. So what are some ways that we can be communicating effectively to our clients? You re- there are sort of two, I call them, there's two engines, really. There's two, uh, if, you have a, if you think of your business, uh, your pet business as being a, a marketing machine, a, a sales machine. And yeah, we, you know, I, I love my clients' dogs. I'm not um, in any way, uh, you know, want to productize <laughs> the dogs. You know, that's not what I mean. But I mean, if you're, if you're a small business owner or even a medium-sized business owner, then, you know, as well as being the walker or the, the groomer or the, the doggy daycare owner, well, you're, you're the marketer of that thing, you know? So you want to you wanna think of yourself as having a, a sales machine. And I like to describe it to my guys as being, you have two engines in the sales machine. So one engine is dealing with um, constantly getting eyes on the business of people who are going to be an ideal client for you, you know? So you have, um, this is done with, uh, any social media stuff that you might do, um, but also um, any adverts you might be putting out there, uh, any events that you might run um, locally, um, any partnerships that you might do with complimentary pet business owners in your town, um, and any offline marketing materials that you might be putting out there, you know, like a newsletter or leaflets or postcards, that kind of these kind of things. That's engine number one. So you always want to be getting new eyes on your business. Engine number two kicks in as soon as somebody goes from being a prospect interested in your service to being a client. So as soon as they pay you some money, then engine number two kicks in. Engine number two is all about onboarding, making the client feel welcome, trying to stimulate referrals, offering them upsells, cross sells, Mm -hmm. other kind of things, you know? So once you, once you have these two engines going, and it takes a little while <laughs> because you have to set up, you know, the systems and stuff to get this working. But that, that is, once you've got that working, marketing the business, um, it becomes like, um, it becomes quite an exciting thing <laughs> rather than it being a chore. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you kind of, you see the benefits, you see the results, you know, much more often. And when you have, you need to have something like that, even a very basic version of what I've just described. Mm-hmm. You need to have something like that running your business to avoid the kind of feast and famine that a lot of pet business owners end up suffering from. Right. And be able to you know, ramp up one of those engines when you need to, right? And, and, and make Absolutely, sure yeah. and, and, and be, be able to adapt as, as necessary. You know, you know, that second engine 
if you've completely lost clients because COVID has shut everything down, well, you aren't able to to keep them around, right? Like they're they're not able to come in. So you divert all that rest of that energy and fuel that you've got to that first engine. Yeah, yeah. And and to be honest with you, when when the only time your first engine should be really, you know, all of the fuel, as you put it, very well, to be put into that first engine should be when you're very first starting your right. business, really. Sure. As soon as the business is running, there should be, as we, as you kind of, how we led on to this question, we've asked about communication, you know? So the clients, the clients that you have should be getting separate communications. They should be getting different kind of communication to the people who don't know anything about you yet, you know, yeah. because you should be building uh, and testing new services with your existing clients to keep them interested, you know, to see what else to, obviously people's own, um, their needs are changing all the time, you know? So whereas people, people don't love their dog any less than they did before COVID hit, you know, before the <laughs> pandemic, but you know, their needs might have changed, you know? So you need to be continually assessing their needs, communicating with them um, and seeing where they're at, you know? I mean, people's circumstances change all the time, Colin, you know, look at where you guys are maybe maybe six months ago or a year ago, you know, and then five years before that, you're in a massively different place now, even if it's, you know, more kids or, you know, you, the business has changed. But it, but everyone's like that, you know, your clients are like that, dog owners in your town are like that. And so when people's circumstances are changing, this is why you need to be top of mind. That makes the marketing message that you're putting out there, like so crucial, you know, so that it it sings to your your ideal client. Yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned there, like, nothing is static, like everything is dynamic. And we can get in our mindset of like, well, I've always had these clients, I feel like I've had them forever. And uh, what's going to change, right? But if you're not communicating to them differently, if you're not seeing where their needs are, and where their needs change, you you will wake up one day and be like, Oh, uh, well, nobody needs me anymore, because my services are based on five years ago, or 10 years ago. Uh, so, you know, keeping in contact that way they can tell you what their needs are and you can adapt to to that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. 100%. So thinking of of change and the current state of things, what is the the state of the pet care industry in the UK? Um I think it's pretty good. I think it's in a pretty good um <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm I'm you know, usually pretty optimistic about things. I think um I think there's been a big setback this year, you know, and I think a lot of people have um, realized that they have some kind of big holes in their business um, in their business plan. And it, me included, you know, I mean, if, if you, if, if, if anyone's sitting to this, if you came through lockdown and you, you have, you don't feel like there's anything better that you could be doing to promote your business or add services. So you're not so dependent upon just delivering one thing, then, you know, you're doing better than I am <laughs> because there was certainly, um, you know, whilst, whilst that side of the business did shut down the other side of it, the coaching side that obviously grew, um, and has grown over the last six months further. Pet business, the pet industry has been pretty sort of resilient, pretty recession proof, really, um, for a, a number of um, decades, really. Um, and like I said, people aren't loving their dogs any less than they were before lockdown. Most people, you know, there's going to be the occasional story that we see on the news of a, you know, a bag of puppies being left on the side of the road or something. And that's incredibly sad. But for the most part, people aren't going to give up their dogs because their circumstances have changed. Um, what it does mean is, though, it means that you have to, and I think this is where I think a lot of pet business owners re- really did struggle, was the guys who, not so much my guys in, my, in the pet business circle, because they're, they're practicing the stuff that I teach all the time. So they, they're constantly communicating they're creating newsletters. They have offline marketing materials going. They aren't completely dependent upon social media, you know, which, and when you do offline marketing, you create deeper bonds with your clients because they know more about you and they think more of you as well. You know, they value the service more. So what happened over here was a lot of guys who, who didn't have, who weren't charging very good, very high prices, really. They were charging low prices and they didn't have any great communication with their clients. Well, they've been dropped. A lot of these guys were dropped quite severely when the when the COVID first hit, and they haven't the clients haven't taken them back on, you know. Whereas the guys who were more premium, you know, the clients were more invested in the service. There was more of a connection between the business owner and the client. It wasn't just based around 
this dog walk that I deliver or this pet sit service that I deliver. It was based around more things than that. These, a lot of these guys were paid throughout lockdown for, by some of their clients, you know, very generously um, supported throughout that time. And then they, these guys are almost back up to full capacity again now. Wow, that's that's crazy. That's really good to hear, right? I mean, and you talk about the importance of the communication there. You're really big on the offline marketing uh, because because it does. It's it's this tangible thing, and I like I, I kind of think of it as it's it's this sticky thing, right? It sticks around for a long time as opposed to a social media post that just blips and it's gone. It allows you to stay more on top of mind because it's sitting on the counter, right? Or it's sitting on the fridge, or it's sitting those those kind of places too. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's uh. I've been practicing and preaching, you know, the use of offline marketing for the last four or five years, really. And uh, since I wrote my first book in 2015, yeah, it's, you know, once upon, like when I was, when I first started in 2011, if you could take a half decent picture with your phone and you could, you know, write a witty comment or a, um, if you could write a, a bit of a comment on a, on a Facebook or a social media post that hit a couple of pain points, you could, you could get eyes on the business. And you could get, you know, people inquiring and you could get clients from it. Now, you, to a degree, you still can do that now, but it's much more difficult, you know. It's much more difficult. Social media is a much more noisy place. It does have its place in the marketing mix, but it is just one element of the marketing mix. And I think far too many pet business owners, they don't have any offline by offline, we mean anything not online, really, you know, so they don't have, well, yeah, I mean, you, <laughs> but, but, you know, you get people, if I say, well, you don't want to be too dependent upon your offline market, on your online marketing, and someone might say, well, I, I actually, I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and I write blogs, and I, 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 um, I'm on Pinterest, and, and I, well, you think, well, actually, that, that's still all online marketing, you know, they're still all online channels, you know, and not everybody is on there. That's the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of your clients, the ones that you should really be wanting to be serving, you know, like people with, you know, business owners, successful people, affluent people in your town who um, love their dogs, but they're incredibly busy. So they can't provide everything that their dogs need. You know, lot, most of these people, they aren't on social media, you know, they aren't like messing around in Facebook groups. Like I see a lot of, um, pet business owners do, you know, a lot of the time. And again, I'm not totally dissing that because I, I use social media to build my um, email list and stuff as well. But again, it's just like one part of the mix. Right. Well, and as you said, like you are, you can target different people with these different forms of communication. So these two engines that you're running, you know, maybe the biggest broadcast that you have is the social media so that you can just capture as many people. But the ones that you do have, that's where you send your newsletters. That's where you send your, you sp can spend some of this offline marketing and offline communication to make it sticky, make them tangible and really focus on, as you said, the, the, the people you actually want to have. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and they will, they will show themselves, you know, if you give them a pathway to find out more about your business, either by signing up for a free guide or signing up for a tip sheet or signing up for um, just your email list, even if you're providing, you know, content consistently, um, they're going to find you, you know, they're going to find you and they're going to put their hand up and say, yes, I'm interested. I want to find out more. And then if you offer them the opportunity to sign up to your newsletter, then they're going to put their hand up again and say, yeah, I'm interested in that. And then bingo, you've got them then, you know, because I think this, the, the, I think the, the big thing that, that I've um, been practicing in my business and, and on my PBIC members have, uh, when they when they do this and then they realize how well it works, like they never go back to the way they were doing it before. So almost everybody is building an email list in my world. You know, they're communicating via email. And that's because that's where you do most of your selling. You know, it's much easier to sell your services via an email. And the reason for that is because the email is, it, I mean, providing you do it in a, you know, a storytelling um, way and you are, you know, entertaining, educational. You're not just saying, Buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. <laughs> people, people get really sick of that quite quickly. But <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're entertaining them, you're building a relationship, it's like a little um, it's like a private conversation almost, you know, that you're having with someone with the email. Uh, whereas if you're trying to talk to them on social media, even in the messenger format, well then there's other messages coming in, and then on Facebook there's notifications, you know. 
this person's going out for a run, this person's getting married, your Aunt Janice has just bought a new hat, and all these things are happening all the same time on Facebook, which makes it a very difficult place to get people's attention and to keep it whilst you, uh, you know, communicate how your services can, can be a benefit to them. Yeah, when you are competing with Aunt Janice's hat, no matter how wonderful of a hat it is, right, you know you're not on equal footing right there. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, just building on that, obviously one of the big things that I hear from pet business owners is they struggle to stand out from the competition, you know, all the time. It's really hard to stand out from the competition because there's so much competition. Um, But yeah, you're right. You know, when you're competing with Dan Janice's hat as well, uh, you're making life infinitely harder for yourself. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I I did want to touch on um, a lot of our listeners are based here in the U.S. And so I wonder if you could give us some context uh, about the differences in the pet care industry um, in the UK versus the US, just to help us a little understand a little bit about you know, where, where you guys are coming from and, and how we can all relate. I don't think there are that many differences, really. Um, I have about probably about 10% of my uh, member base is based in, um, in the US or Canada or Australia as well. So I am familiar with some of the practices there. And to me, they don't, they don't, Come up, there's no insurmountable problems, you know, that insurmountable differences between uh, the different nations, you know, in yeah. the Western world anyway. Um, I think maybe it's from a, I think from a promotional point of view, uh, with, with almost, it's just almost like this for everything though, Colin, you know, like when we, like if you guys, you know, when you guys have something and then it comes over here a little bit later, you know, a bit like a bit like a movie release or something. Sure. Well, that happens with trends and stuff as well. And and you guys have had a lot more dog walkers, daycares and, and stuff, you know, for they've been more prevalent, I think, for a, for a longer time. And certainly they're more widespread. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's yeah, I think that I don't think there's a lot, huge amount of difference between the actual um, work and practices. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. And that's uh, that's. One, that's good to know, right? It helps us all understand that when we say we're all in this together, like literally, like we're all experiencing the same things. Uh, and it just, it helps, um, you know, as we share advice and as we share experiences, uh, it, it translates from from one area to another very easily. Yeah, yeah the, and, and again, there might be some, you know, subtle differences. So we have a, a private discussion group um, in a peppers in a circle. And occasionally, you know, one of the American members will say, well, you know, why, why are you doing that? You know, what, what, what does that mean? What, what, why are you doing this? And by the same token, I, when they post something and I'll be thinking, well, why, you know, why are you guys doing it that way? But um, they're, they're in the big scheme of things, they're quite small differences, you know? Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Uh, and so kind of in that context, as far as, um, you know, we're all the same, uh, as we look across previous slowdowns and market crashes in, in years past, was curious if you could help us understand what makes COVID so different or, or makes it a little more challenging than ones in the past. I think it's the uncertainty element of it in many ways is the biggest challenge because over here, we went into lockdown late, but we went into lockdown pretty hard. And then we've gradually been coming out of it and we've had a number of sort of on a city by city basis, local lockdowns. Not many, to be honest with you, a handful, you know, since then. Um, but for, and for the most part now, I would say things are getting back to normal. You know, yes, there's um, a lot of work to do still. But as far as I can see from the pet industry point of view, um, we're back at the races, you know. And certainly groomers had a massive um, backlog almost <laughs> of dogs that they needed to catch up on, you know. And, um, and similar to myself, and similar to yourself, I guess, originally, you know, we, we lost some um, previous bookings that we'd had for people going away and stuff like that. Um, so, that, so that, but there's still a kind of an, an uncertainty element of it, you know, so over here, they're worried about the winter, you know, and how bad is the, the winter going to be with relation to COVID? Is it going to cause a, a second spike? So everybody is uh, a little bit on edge and a little bit nervous about that. Now, from the point of view of um, other recessions, I've only really had a business through, well, I started my business midway through the last recession. And in the last recession, there was, there was literally like less money in the system, you know, that, we, that everything was very, there wasn't a lot of liquidity um, 
at first. And whereas he, this time there, there, there is, I think, you know, there's been a lot of government assistance um, for businesses and for employees. Um, so I think there's an uncertainty element. I don't know how you guys are feeling. Obviously, I know you've had the, the countries, some parts of the country are open, aren't they? And some are closing and, or locked down. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's really it's really patchy and it's really heavily dependent on on where you are. I know where he, where we are here in Missouri, where it's a little more lax, um, you know, but that still doesn't translate into confidence of our clients, right? So we we get a lot of last minute. We it seems like since the beginning of the year, the number of last minute bookings, and we're talking bookings a day before or the day of, have just spiked. And and we've really attributed that to people just unsure of their travel plans and waiting last like last minute to make that final call. And so there's, there's uncertainty on the client side because they don't know if they're going places if they need us. And then there's uncertainty on our side where we're going, are they going to need us? They told, they, they told us we were going to travel, but we don't know. And then there are other parts of the country where it's pretty much, you know, there, people there are a lot more confident. Maybe that's because they haven't been as locked down as long or as hard. So it is, it is really patchy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and similar, similar here, although not as locked down over here, I think, and I think there is, there is a fear factor and I think there's a fear factor hanging over um, from clients. Again, this is where the communication comes back in, you know, and if you're constantly communicating with your clients to remind them that you're open for business, to show them that you um, are, have adapted to the new, you know, the new restrictions, social distancing or, Mm -hmm cleanliness, um, routines, whatever it might be that you have had to implement in your business to keep it going and to reassure the client as well. You know, this is all, I mean, there's a lot of people listen to this now, but like not everybody's going to be doing this. You know, if you, if you are the guy who's sending out or the gal who's sending out, um, you know, a, a postcard once a month to your clients to tell them about a, a special offer that you've got going, or you're sending out a quarterly newsletter, or you're sending out an email a couple of times a week to let them know what's happened in the business, this fantastic thing that you've done all of the time. You're just, you're just top of mind, top of mind. And people are reassured by that. They are reassured mm-hmm. by the communication. You know, so and therefore they are much going to be much more likely to continue to use your service or to start using you again if they've stopped. Yeah. Um, and the other, the other sort of to take that to the extreme is that makes it a tremendous opportunity now for you to not be timid, not be fearful, you know, for you to really put yourself out there. Um, and whilst all of the other pet businesses in your town are, you know, hibernating. And, you know, they're going to emerge from their cave, scratching their, scratching their bums, blinking into the sunset, you know, thinking, oh, where's, where have all my clients gone? You know, and, and this, so this is why you need, to be, you need to be out there now doing something to get eyes on your business. When clients are unsure and there's uncertainty, we can do our small part of helping them be more sure about us, at least, right? That's the, that's the corner of the world that we can control. We can let them know, I'm still here. I've taken these trainings. This is what I'm working on. This is what I'm looking forward to in the rest of the year. That's what we know we can control and do our small part to help them be more confident to use us, right? That that's, it's this, it is this integral relationship that you have with your clients. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't um, underplay that either. And it's not as it's, for them, it's not a small part, you know, mm. it's not a, I mean, yeah, in the big scheme of, you know, how many people have COVID or how many people are dying every day all over the world, you know, your dog walking business might be a small part of it, but for them, it isn't, right. you know, for them, uh, again, this comes down to positioning, how you've communicated with them, how you've, uh, how, how you've positioned yourself in their eyes, you know, everybody should be positioning themselves as being the trusted expert, the trusted pet advisor, you know, and then, they're going to, like you say, they're going to much more rapidly come back to use your services um, if they ever left at all. Have you heard about Time to Pet? Claire from Acton Critter Sitters has this to say. Time to Pet has honestly revolutionized how we do business. My sitters can work much more independently because they have ongoing access to customer and pet information without relying on me. I save hours upon hours of administrative time on billing, processing payments, and generating paychecks. If you are looking for a new pet sitting software for your business, give Time to Pet a try. As a listener of Pet Sitter Confessional, you'll get 50% off your first three months when you sign up at timetopet.com slash confessional. 
uh, I do want to continue this conversation about recovery, right? Because that's that's where this is going here. And at the top of the show, you mentioned that you had a business that wasn't as successful as the other ones. So what kind of things did you learn from that? And can we be applying to as we recover, as we dig ourselves out of this? Yeah, so I'd go back a time a little bit further, actually, because it'll give it a little bit of better context. So when I started my business in 2011, uh, my dog adventure business, Pack Leader Dog Adventures, and I worked for a sales rep as a sales rep for 10 years before that. And then I, I left that job, didn't really want to do it for another 30. So I left that job and uh, I knew I wanted to work outside and I knew I wanted to work um, with dogs. Um, well, no, I didn't, actually, I didn't. I, I really, I, all I knew was I just wanted to work outside. <laughs> and then, um, at, the, at the time, I was helping out with my local rescue, walking dogs, and that kind of got the germ of an idea of these dogs could be given more exercise. Um, I knew there was a lot of pedigree dogs around and people aren't giving them pedigree jobs, you know, they aren't giving them any kind of outlet for their, for their breed instincts. Um, so, yeah, so through a period of research, and then Pack Leader Dog Adventures was born. Now, I that was quite a unique business at the time because, I mean, now almost everybody's doing adventures and hikes and stuff, but back then it was uh, fairly um, unique. You know, it was um, pretty sort of groundbreaking, really. And I don't, I don't live in a – I live in a northeast town um, in the northeast of England. It's a very working class, um, you know, traditionally built upon the shipyards and the mining industry. And um, yeah, a bit sort of bit rough, you know, a bit rough up here. Yeah. So, not like rough, rough, like just rough. <laughs> you, you made it rough, rough, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, so what I'm saying is, this wasn't like a you know cosmopolitan um, Beverly Hills or Notting Hill type place. Yeah. <laughs> um, and however, I still managed to make a really a really good success of this business because it was different and because it was premium. You know, I wanted to be premium all the time, and. So I had a lot of success with my business for the first two or three years, and then it grew, and then I took on a staff member, and then we grew some more. And I didn't really want to go further sideways with more staff or franchising it at the time, anyway. Um, so I thought, well, what else can we do? So I thought, well, well, we'll do an online store. We'll build an online store, and uh, we will be the the dog adventure company. You know, we will be the the guys who uh, use all of the gear every day. And so we will be out, you know, taking videos with us with the dogs with um, backpacks on and mm. the rough wear, um, frisbees and all of it and everything. And it was, it was, a, I mean, looking back now, it wasn't probably the most original idea, <laughs> but, but we thought it was at the time. But anyway, sunk a ton of money into that and uh, also brought in some marketing experts in inverted commas um, to help me to build the store and to do the paper click and everything that went along with that. And basically I, just, I chucked a, a shed load of money at it for about two years um, and it didn't really do anything at all. I didn't do enough anyway for me. And it wasn't a lack of passion. It wasn't a lack of uh, energy or enthusiasm on my part or even finance, you know, because I was earning good money and I plowed it all into this venture. Um, it was, there wasn't really a, a, a market and strategy behind it. And so I also, when after about two years of doing that, I realized that I actually hated that business model. I hated, I hated getting deliveries, packaging them up, and then sending them off to people. I probably should have thought about this before I did the online store. I appreciate that as well, Colin. I'll say it before you do. <laughs> but you, you don't have to, you know, send... You don't have to get very many complaints from people who say, you know, oh, we've ordered the wrong size rough wear boots for you to think, oh, God, you know, this is like, this is not what I signed up for. Yeah. And yeah. And so I had to kind of put a pin in that idea. And two things came from it. One was that I realized it wasn't a business model for me. It wasn't something that I really wanted to enjoy doing. Mm. I wasn't a behind the scenes person like that. I wanted to put myself front and center and use my personality in the marketing. And the other thing was the marketing sort of tactics that I'd used, well, they weren't mine. They were the marketing agency that I used. They didn't work either, you know? So we plowed tons of money into, like I say, pay-per-click adverts for things. And we're looking back with hindsight now, what we, we weren't building a list, Colin. You know, we weren't building a list of people who were interested in this stuff to build a relationship with them to make it easier for us to sell more stuff, you know? And so I, that was the big sort of marketing epiphany that I had really where I thought, you know what? Whatever I do next, I need to really um, 
get myself um, up to scratch with marketing. And so I went on a big marketing um, education and learned how to do all these things that I that I do in my own business and that I teach now, you know, like premium pricing, positioning, uh, using lead generation marketing, um, offline communications, all this kind of thing. Um, yeah, and uh, so that was that was an expensive lesson, but it was a necessary lesson, I think. Yeah, well, and a, a reminder to us all of of that these things happen, right? Like you can go with the best intentions, the best idea, the passion, and then you start finding these little things of like, you know what? Actually, I don't, I don't like shipping things around, and I don't like dealing with returns. Like who who would like that? Wow! But you, sometimes you don't know until you get into it, and not going. And what I think is so key there is that you didn't go, well, that's it. I'm done with this entire thing, right? That's nothing will ever work. I'll never do that again. You went, uh, okay, what can I learn to make this, you know, to, to move on from this? What can I dig into? What kind of skills can I bring, bring back on uh, so that I can make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again? And as, as we are all still recovering and digging ourselves out, it's a good reminder that there are, you know, there are skills that we can can bring from this there are lessons we can we can bring from this as well to make us better in the future and sometimes you don't know that you don't like something until you do it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh i think i did well cutting my losses when i did at the time sure. and yeah i think i think just picking up on something that you said there just there now this is something that i so whenever anybody um, comes to me now with an idea, you know, and my guys have lots of ideas for lots of things all the time, you know, and and often they're great ideas and we say, okay, that's how can we plug this into the business, the existing business. But sometimes people come to you with an idea and and you just, I, I look at it from the point of view of with the experience that I've had with the store and then everything since then of like, okay, who's who's going to buy this? You know, who's going to buy this? Who's going to be interested in it? And how are you going to get eyes on it? You know, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and where's it going to lead to? You know, because you you really want some kind of business that has some kind of continuity, recurring revenue in it. You know, that's um, yeah. So that's I I always say to I, I always say to my guys like if I was going to do a business like that again, like an online business, it would be some kind of recurring subscription type thing. You know, um, because then you, at least you are building it with a recurring revenue in mind. You know, and yeah. and our business lends itself very well to recurring revenue. You know, through dog walkers and pet sitters you know this is like we should be and groomers as well they're the same daycare owners you know i always say you know unless you unless if you're a dog walker all you have to do is not lose the dog and if you're a groomer all you have to do is not set fire to the dog if you do those two things you shouldn't really lose the client (laughs) that needs to be on a t-shirt no dog set (laughs) days since the last dog set on fire zero or like oh whatever anyway but (laughs) but (laughs) and the, uh, I think the, one of the reasons that this, you, you know, your back, your story there is so relevant to today is many dog walkers, uh, groomers, people, uh, you know, as you mentioned, like tried to shift online, and many of them started to offer products online, and 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 it is a whole nother ball game. There's a whole nother side of this dealing with physical goods, dealing with returns, dealing with all that, and so if that's on your mind, like you need to be thinking of that. You need to already be preparing yourself for these things that in our normal job of walking and not setting dogs on fire, we don't have to deal with. And so that is, it is, it is an opportunity, but it does have these other, this baggage that we have to be thinking of as well. Yeah, totally. And and you kind of have to think of what, what, what's the end game here? You know, what is it, where's this going to lead me to? And it's a natural I've seen I've seen it time and time again since then, where people start adding on to their their services, like oh now we're we're selling treats, you know, mm. or now we're selling um, raw hides, or now we're selling uh, antler bones, or you know, and and, and it's that the margin is often very small, you know, especially once you've packaged it up and and invested the time that you're going to invest into sorting it out you know and 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 and, you know, and delivering it to the client and all this kind of thing because so we, we forget about that mm-hmm. and they're often they're often just like one-time purchases you know so people only really going to need like one dog brush or you know or one or maybe two antler bones um you know other stuff you can maybe get them to buy more often like treats but it's still it's like relatively um small margin. And I mean, if you have, it depends on the business model as well. You know, if you're, if you're a big daycare center, then, and you have people coming and going all the time and you maybe have a grooming room as well, like 
Yeah, absolutely. You've got the footfall, you know, yeah. it's not going to be too difficult for you to um, increase the average transaction value by a few dollars or a few pounds or several even, you know, by getting people to buy some additional stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't think people, especially smaller pet business owners, they don't think enough about um, well, what, what is the end game here for this thing? You know, what I'm, what I'm thinking about starting, you know, realistically, how many of these things am I going to sell? And therefore, how much money am I going to be able to make? Yeah. And that's not to discount that it is not an opportunity or something that you should pursue. There's just all these other things that are not necessarily, I was going to say tangential, but they're very not tangential to this. They're very much what that, what running that style of business is and is just a part of it. So that's just a, a word of caution, word of advice to go, hey, are we also thinking of this? And I love how you said that of what's the end game? What's the end game? What do we actually want out of this? Other than just the here and now, I'm trying to generate revenue. What's, what, does this have legs to, to go somewhere? Absolutely. And, and, and I, don't, yeah, I don't want to sound like um, I'm poo-pooing on people's ideas about doing this kind of thing. But obviously, I've done it myself. You know, I have done that. And it, it didn't not work because of a lack of um, enthusiasm or dollars that I threw at it. Right. It, uh, it, was, it was just, it's a, it's a difficult model, you know. And it, I mean, anything where you can be Amazoned is dangerous now, you know. So, um, yeah, you've got, you got to think long and hard about it. You've got to make sure there's a good story in there. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got to have some kind of recurring revenue thing. Really, I think what, my, what, what, what it taught me was, what, what I learned from that, in the subsequent months following when I closed the store, was the idea of selling information, you know? Mm. So if I can now, if I can sell information, well, information I can package up and sell many different ways, you know, sure. and, and I can, uh, you know, PDFs, books, videos, courses, webinars, seminars, online, offline events uh, to, you know, I can produce a newsletter and I can send it to 10 people or I can send it to a hundred people, you know, it's like a, yeah, information is something. And I think people underestimate how much, um, how much information experience that they have. That's a, that's a, a, a good saying there. Of like, we, we do underestimate how much we actually know. It's just a lot of us never have taken the time to put pen to paper and write it out or do something yeah. with that. So that can be a really simple, easy exercise that you do of just go, okay, what, what do I know about taking care of a dog? Well, it's actually a lot. I guarantee you it's a lot more than just immediately comes to mind, but it takes a little bit of a process to start putting that down on, on, on paper. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like you, uh, it's an excellent point you just made there. You know, you, you have all this experience and you have all these systems in your head that you use and um, you know what works in your own business. And all, all, all it really does take is putting it down on paper yeah. and systemize it a little bit better. But then, well, then it becomes an asset, then, you know, right. once it's down, well, then it's an asset and you can do a lot with that. You know, you can, like I said, you can turn it into some kind of training material to help someone else do what you do. Uh, you could use it to potentially scale and, and, and systemize and scale and franchise your business, you know, that way, if, if that's where you wanted to go. Um, I sort of alluded to it on the call that you did uh, on uh, my podcast, you know, about uh, the community and stuff that you guys are, are, are like setting up and stuff now. And you guys have an excellent model to me that could be, you know, systemized and um and, and rolled out to people who want to do what you do, you know, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just, uh, but but you know, you're not not exclusive to you. There's hundreds of pet business owners out there who could do this. Yeah, that's that, again, that's a reminder. We all have something that we know that we have, find joy in, that we have passion behind, that we can help share with others and do something with, and that is. That should be really encouraging, especially in times where we don't feel like we have a lot of control over other things, or our main business is down uh, considerably, or we're trying to recover. Like looking into yourself is one of the best places to start. And going, what do I know? What do I know well? What can I do? And then grow from there. Start from there. Start putting things down and see where it goes. Yeah, and everybody's niche. Everybody's has the ability to occupy a slightly different niche. You know, so. I do my thing where I do group adventures and I've created a great business model for people who want to, um, you know, charge more than people do for solo walks to charge that for group walks and to scale it and, you know, do two walks in a lot of money. You have a model that is based around, you know, the family and the whole, you know, taking the kids to the meet and greet and all this kind of things. Like, but again, for, for a family who wants to do that, like they, 
they're not going to look at me and say, oh, well, I, they, they would look at you and say, oh, well, that, that, that more fits what I want to do, you know? So Yeah, yeah, and abs- absolutely. And that's, that is a good, re- again, just a wonderful reminder of we all have things we can contribute. And, and we, our expertise is our learned experience. And that, that as, you know, as you're saying here, like that has value, that has inherent value when we start putting it to work for us. And whether that's sharing with other uh, business owners or trying to see how that translates into clients or that, that kind of thing to get them to pay for that kind of experience too. As we look towards the future, um, I was wondering if you had some steps or some tips for us to start digging out and start on the road to recovery as businesses or at, on a personal level too. It's great to be a part of some kind of community where people are already doing the kind of things that you want to do. You know, <laughs> so it's been a case for me where I've been involved with lots of um, coaching groups and various masterminds, and some of them cost. 50 pounds a month and some of them cost a thousand pounds a month, you know, and, and I've took some value from all of them and being in an environment like that has been incredibly helpful to me over the years to help me push through these various kind of barriers and stuff, you know, so you need to be like growth. You do need to have a growth mindset <laughs> and not everybody does, you know, and a learning mindset as well and a willingness to, to try new things, you know, and to understand that if you want to take your business to a, a bigger or a better place, you're going to have to do slightly different things to what you did before. You know, you're going to have to take some of the things that you did that have got you to where you are now and, and to do them. You're going to have to do more of them. <laughs> There's going to be some things that you're going to have to maybe do less of. And there are going to be some new things that you're going to have to do, um, you know, as well. So there's like a continuous um, upskilling, you know, of um, the marketing uh, knowledge required to, to 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 kick your business on. So definitely having like a growth mindset and, and and wanting to kick on that would be like the one of the first things really from a sort of practical um, nuts and bolts point of view. Um, I talk about uh, you guys have read Walk Yourself Wealthy. You know, I talk about the five keys to a successful business in there, mm-hmm. and um, just to, to touch upon a couple of those. You know, one is to be premium. Uh, you know, you should always be striving. In my opinion, anyway certainly in my experience, bore this out and with my coaching clients, you should always be striving to be and be seen as being the premium pet provider in your town. You know, there's um, the, the benefits are massive. You know, you generally attract the best clients. You work less hours in the business. Uh, you create, you make more money, you know, to uh, spend on your family or your dogs or to invest in your education or your business like I have. And, just to touch upon what we said before, you know, the only reason I was able to uh, comfortably launch an online store, I actually launched two online stores because the first one I did it with a business partner and then we fell out. And so I had to start all over again. But the only reason I was able to do that was because I was, uh, had a good cash flow, you know, really good cash flow in the business. And so I had this money to, I was able to invest in new things. So being premium is key, you know, being pre- premium. And if you aren't premium right now, like you need to figure out, right, what do I need to do to be premium? <laughs> you know, yeah. And it, it, ain't, it ain't about going on more uh, dog training courses or, mm-hmm. um, you know, COVID cleanliness courses or something like that. That, that ain't going to necessarily make you more premium. You know, the, mm. the more market and stuff that you can plug in, the better. And being specialized as well really is the other one, you know, being niched. If you can niche down with your services, either with the type of dogs that you look after or with the type of service that you offer, or the type of client who you serve, you know, um, that those two things are tied together, really, you know, because if you if you if you're premium, um, then you're seen as being uh, more specialized and people expect to pay more for a for a specialist. Yeah. And that yeah, that that idea. Of, well, they just expect, right? It's just that's just what you do for a better service or a better market. So you just pay more for it because that's what you do. And part of being premium, you mentioned of it's not necessarily what you're doing day to day operations because you're already doing a great job. We just you, you know, it's messaging it right. It's part of the marketing to differentiate yourself, and that, that that's one of that first steps to get the clients that you want. And then that idea of of specializing and niching down. Sometimes that happens organically. Sometimes you look up and you go, "I'm only taking care of bird dogs today." That's huh. Wonder what I can lean into about that, or you know, if maybe that's where yeah. your market is, and you just become that you just become the hound person, or whatever. You know, other other times you can go at it a little more tactfully, but that is that is something that um, you know it just has a, a lot of value to doing and thinking about. It does, yeah. It gives it gives you mar- it gives you marketing a lot more focus, you know. So right. if you are uh, 
um, you know, if your dog, if your thing is Dachshunds, yeah. and you guys went to Dachshunds, were you? We've got, we've got a Dachshund, Kobe, he, yeah. he's 12. <laughs> that's right, that's right, I remember. Um, or if your thing is Mastiffs, or if your thing is squashy-faced bulldog breeds, or bird dogs, like you say, yeah. you know, that's, that, that makes your marketing so much easier, you know, because you're already a semi expert in this, you know, you're already, you already know more about that than you do about anything else. So it's, Mm -hmm. you can more confidently talk about your niche, your expertise, um, because you're already in it, you know, Um, (laughs) it's easier to be known. It's easier to be found. So it's easier for other Daxi owners to find you, you know, because birds of a feather flock together and, and, and like there's little communities online and offline as well, you know, and people are much more likely to refer you if they know you are, um, a specialist in one particular thing. And this applies to trainers and, and groomers and stuff too. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's one of these, th- <laughs> well, pricing and niching, specializing. These are two things that people resist. Like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but they are, the, they're the things that make the biggest difference to the business, you know, and, and just sort of taking it a bit, tie it in with what we said before about, and thinking about COVID and stuff as well, you know? So if you think about, um, okay, so my business has been adversely affected by COVID. And if something like COVID was to happen again, then what would I do? You know, hmm. and, and like I said, one thing you could do is a similar thing to what I've done, which is to leverage your expertise and to sell, uh, package up your knowledge and sell it in a different way. Well, it's much easier to do that if it's, if it's niche, you know, if it's niche knowledge about a particular breed, because with, you know, with the World Wide Web and stuff, it's so easy now to connect with. Dachshund owners or bulldog fanatics or bird dog uh, freaks <laughs> anywhere in the world, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, difficult to do, but uh, once you do it, it's, it's a game changer. It is. There's a lot of, there is a lot of value there. And we've all experienced the owners who are diehards for a particular breed or type of dog, or they've had a shared experience with dogs. So whether that's dogs that, um, you know, for one of the things that I know we actually find ourselves doing a lot of is dogs that need insulin shots. We've just gained a lot of experience through that. So that's something that we mentioned, you know, that, that we can, that we can offer. Looking back at those experiences that you have, if you have no way, if you don't know where to start, like you, you can just look back at your own experiences and go, well, what have I done a lot of? Uh, and did I like that? If I did, okay, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more and start telling people that I, I can do that. I'm good at that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the process that I tell people to go down when they're looking for what to niche down to, you know? So look at your existing client base. Where, where are you heavy in one particular dog or type of client that you're, that you're helping? Uh, what do you love? You know, what do you love doing? Where's your passion? Because obviously if you're going to niche down, you're going to, you're going to want to learn more about that subject. So you might as well do something that you're interested in. Um, and then finally, yeah, make sure that there's a market for it generally, you know? Sure. So the example I give in the book is, you know, don't call yourself the king of Afghan hounds. If there's only like two Afghans in your entire city, you know, because yeah. you're going <laughs> to, your prices are going to have to be way premium. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Super extra deluxe premium. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thinking about a personal side of things, uh, in your mind, what kind of business owner weathers tough storms the best? Well, I mean, it is tough. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's, it, it, it is. It's, but running a business is tough, you know? So <laughs> we asked them, yeah, I mean, it is all the time. You know, business is about solving problems, you know? So you right. first have the problem of, well, I don't have enough clients, you know? And then you might have a problem of, well, I have clients, but I'm not earning enough money, you know? And then you might have a problem of, well, now I'm too busy. So, you know, now I need staff. And, and then like, business is just about how you adapt to solving problems. If you're not in the solving problems game, you shouldn't get a business, you know? And mm. I think you... You shouldn't start a business. And if you've got a business and you are not in the marketing problem solving game, <laughs> then you're gonna you're gonna really struggle as well. Because that is where like you touched upon it before, you know, the, the thing that you do, the walking the dogs, the grooming, you know, we're assuming that you're gonna be pretty good at that already. You probably wouldn't be listening to pet sitter conf- confessional if you you know you didn't know how to do what you do. Your problem is that you don't know how to get better clients, you know, or make them come back more often or, or get them to spend more money. Um, well, you only fix those problems with, um, with a bit more advanced marketing knowledge, you know, and mm-hmm. yeah, just push yourself outside your comfort zone. So if the moment you're only doing um, 
social media stuff, you know, then maybe he's looking to how can I build an email list as well? You know, how can I create a guide to help me to build an email list? If you're only doing, if you're only doing emails, you know, well, how can I do some offline stuff as well? How can I create uh, a kick-ass piece of marketing material that is going to make my clients super proud to be a, a member of like our family? You know, when you start thinking about things like that, it isn't that difficult to hopefully put your passion onto paper and then, you know, this is creating something like that is like you said, something you can use over and over again, you know, with clients and prospects all over your town. Right. Yeah. And if you don't feel like you've ever solved the problem, you're just doing business like this experience through COVID, I guarantee you, you've solved at least one of your clients' problems that they've had. I guarantee it. And, and, re- and so now going, okay, if one person's had that problem, uh, probably more people have had that problem. How do I tell them that I can, I'm a problem solver? Like I can I can help solve that problem for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it, that's what it is. Yeah, we're, we're, people only ever people only ever buy anything to solve a problem, you know. Mm-hmm. So whether it's your dog uh, walking, daycare, grooming, boarding, training services, whatever it is, people need a problem solved. You know, if their dog is at home chewing the house up, or they have an emergency strip trip that they need to make and they need somebody to look after their dog or, you know, like the people buy things to solve problems. So start thinking about your services as the solution to people's problems. That's how you should be kind of framing it when you're promoting yourself. Absolutely. Dom, I have really appreciated this conversation. It's been very enlightening to to think about our services in new ways and to remember our engines that we should be running at all times for our businesses and so much more. But I know we only very, very we only very covered the surface of this, and there's a whole lot more. So, if people, um, I, I should mention that you have a podcast. Uh, so please definitely uh, let us know where people can go listen to that, uh, get connected with you, and and find out more about all that you've got going on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have uh, the Poodle to Pitbull Pet Business Podcast, which is a podcast for pet business owners. Uh, daycares, walkers, groomers, trainers. We had a number of different guests on. We had Colin and Megan on um, just last month, yeah. um, which is fabulous. But there's about 130 episodes. I'm just slightly ahead of you at the moment, yeah. Colin. Who knows? Who knows for how long that will last? <laughs> We're racing. We're racing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing one a week, so you're gonna, you will overtake me eventually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if people want to find out more about me, um, there's kind of two things you can do. Really, one is to go to growyourpetbusinessfast.com forward slash 33 ideas. So that's 33 ideas. And you can get on my email list that way. You get 33 um, tips and hints to help you to grow your pet business. I know you guys are on my email list as well. And I know you guys have also read Walk Yourself Wealthy. So I've got another special offer too. Um, The listeners, any listeners at any time, they can go and get actually a free copy of my um, paper and ink Walk Yourself Wealthy book. Uh, you can go to growyourpetbusinessfast.com forward slash free dash copy and you'll get a copy of Walk Yourself Wealthy. I think it's um, it's actually like a fiver, five English pounds to cover the cost of the post and packaging and stuff. But um, we'll send that out um, anywhere in the world. Beth will package it up and we'll even send you a little bonus CD and stuff as well. And yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Is that the best way for them to maybe find out more about what I do? Yeah, yeah. Read the book, listen to the podcast and check out your website. And I do have to say, as far as uh, website titles go, I love your website, uh, Grow Your Pet Business Fast. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> it's, it's really simple, easy to remember, <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes it grows, sometimes your business will grow really fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as long as it grows, you know, strongly and steadily, um, that's what you're after. You know, it's it's really easy to grow a business fast. You just charge really low prices. <laughs> you'll, have, you'll have clients, you'll have clients coming out of your ears in no time, but you'll, you know, you'll, you'll quickly get sick of that routine. So growing a business strongly, uh, you know, with more mm. premium prices, you attract better clients. Um, you guys have seen this too, haven't you? You know, it's, uh, it just makes for a whole better experience for the business owner. It, it really does. Yeah. If you want to grow quickly, say you'll do it for free. Right, like that's one. That's the extreme end of the spectrum. Say, I will yeah. do whatever you want for free. Uh, do you want to grow that way? Would you be doing that for thirty years? No, nobody would do that for thirty years. So there's a there's there's a the, on that spectrum. Right is where you need to find what what you're comfortable with as a business owner. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed um, chatting to you once again. I feel like we're really close pals now. We I know. In a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
haven't spoke to my father this often. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't read too much into that, Colin. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, you know, that's it. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, and I uh, hope to have you back on again soon to, to dive, dive, dive deeper and cover some more, more topics. So it's been a, been a real joy. Thank you so much, Dom. You're very welcome. Take good care of yourself. I really appreciated Dom's mentioning of how we need to be surrounding ourselves with like-minded people. When we don't have a good support team, we can have a hard time seeing a path forward or seeing how we would ever be successful. Getting plugged into a community, whether that's local or out on the internet, of like-minded people who are also trying to be as successful as they can, solving those problems and facing fear in the face and overcoming all of those obstacles is a great way to learn and be supported for yourself and then invest that back into people around you as well. We'd love to hear how you're doing. So check out our website, PetsitterConfessional.com. You can contact us through there or send us an email, feedback at PetsitterConfessional.com as well. We want to know how you're doing, how things are going, and how we can be of any help or any assistance. We do want to thank our sponsor, Time to Pet, for making this week's show possible. Head on over to TimeToPet.com forward slash confessional to check out that discount. We hope you have a wonderful week and we'll be back again soon. Thank you so much for listening, sharing episodes, and just being awesome.